The second thing, and what makes this really unlike any court order I've ever seen, is that she turns around and says, when you brief this, when you give me this seminar, let's assume two scenarios. In scenario number one, we're going to issue a jury instruction based on the premise that these papers are a duck. And it's actually just, like, wrong. Like, why don't you issue a write a jury instruction on the basis that the world is flat. It's a false premise. And the false premise is that this is a jury question rather than a a legal question. Uh, That's scenario number one. Scenario number two is even worse because, as as Roger says, we're going to assume a false position of law, right? So now we're going to assume the earth is flat, write a, a jury instruction based on the idea that I have already determined that the Earth is flat as a matter of law. I'm Quinta Jurassic, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, March 23rd, 2024. It's another episode of Trump's Trials and Tribulations, recorded on March 21st in front of a live audience on YouTube in Riverside. I sat down with Benjamin Wittes and Roger Parloff to talk about Trump's Supreme Court brief and his presidential immunity appeal, along with recent evidentiary rulings from Justice Merchan in the New York criminal case against Trump. We also discussed Judge Cannon's odd proposed jury instructions and the relevance or irrelevance of the Presidential Records Act in the Mar-a-Lago case. And of course, we took audience questions from Lawfare Material supporters on Riverside. It's the Lawfare Podcast, March 23rd, Trump's Trials and Tribulations, Judge Cannon's Concerning Jury Instructions. Let's start off in Washington, D.C. with the Supreme Court. Uh, We are getting the briefing coming in for Trump's immunity case. Um, The Supreme Court will hear arguments in that case on April 25th, which I believe is the last day um, of hearings of the term. And we have now Trump's merits brief, which is 67 pages and uh, quite a document. I think it is it is fair to say. Um, So Ben, let me start with you. What did you make of this? So most of it is exactly the document that you would expect, given the DC Circuit's rulings and Trump's approach uh, at the DC Circuit level, which is to say he insists that there is absolute immunity, that the absolute immunity is, you know, covers this immense range of what he calls official acts, which includes what a lot of us would call unofficial acts, and that it is, you know, deeply rooted in the Constitution and its history, notwithstanding the fact that it has never been recognized by any court in the country before. Now, I don't want to sound dismissive of the idea that there is some kind of immunity that attaches to the official conduct of the president. I, if I sound dismissive of this vision of immunity, however, it is because I am. And um, this is what Judge Chutkin rejected. Uh, it is also what the D.C. Circuit unanimously rejected, despite a lot of people's assuming that it would be attractive to some of them. And I don't think it's going anywhere at the Supreme Court level. And because of, I think, that recognition, there are a number of other arguments that are kind of slipped in, which is, and by the way, if you don't grant, you know, if you insist on some lesser kind of qualified immunity, here are the parameters of the qualified immunity that we want, which is to say, as unqualified as possible. Uh, and there's also a, uh, I th- in something of a surprise to me, an inclusion of what people who have followed the site uh, long know is a is a special interest of lawfare's, which is the the so-called clear statement rule. Uh, My old enemy, yes, Quint- returned Quint- at Quint- last. Quint's enemy, Jack Goldsmith's dear friend, um, and my frenemy. But they've kind of slipped in a clear statement rule argument here, well down in the argument. And I think that those latter two points are a concession that realistically this, the broad immunity argument 
that there just aren't five votes for that, and there may not even be three. Uh, so that's my sort of high altitude sense of the brief. I will say, so I think I'm broadly in the same camp as Ben. The thing that I found really striking about this this document is something that, Ben, I think you said to me is consistent with previous filings by this DC legal team. It is very, very willing to take things completely out of context and frankly, completely distort them. Really, Quinta, you don't think these have (laughs) neutrally uh, appropriate and dispassionate accounts of cases like Marbury versus Madison? And when it quotes Justice Alito uh, from his, um, you know, you don't think that Justice Alito would see his meaning in, in those quotations? So what so what Ben is referencing for those of you who haven't had the delightful experience of reading through this document is that Trump at multiple points quotes to both uh, Justice Alito's dissent and to the majority opinion in Trump v. Vance, the case that the Supreme Court decided during Trump's time in office concerning uh, the president's amenability to criminal process, specifically uh, the Manhattan DA, then Cyrus Vance's effort to get a hold of his financial records as part of the investigation that eventually turned into the case that is currently being prosecuted by DA Alvin Bragg. The specifics of the case are not actually relevant here, although it does show that everything in this universe is somehow connected. Um, but what's important is that the court, the majority basically said, you know, Yes, the president can be criminally investigated um, by uh, a DA during his his time in office. Um, and what is striking here is that there is this quote um, that I, when I read in in Trump's brief, I thought that doesn't seem like something that the, the Vance majority would have written, uh, because it it says uh, essentially the president would be a target for criminal prosecution after he leaves office, including by any of. And then we begin the quote from Vance. The The 2300 district attorneys in this country who are responsive to local constituencies, local interests, and local prejudices, end quote. And then we have the site to Vance. Now, if you look at Vance, what you see is that that is in the middle of a paragraph where the majority is describing Trump's argument, um, essentially saying, you know, the president argues that the 2300 district attorneys, et cetera, et cetera, before it then goes on in the following paragraphs to completely demolish that argument (laughs) and say, no, that's wrong. There's also this citation to Justice Alito's dissent, where Alito is arguing essentially that, uh, you know, a sitting president can't be uh, forced to respond to these sorts of informational requests. What that leaves out is that Alito was talking about a sitting president, not a former president. And you see that kind of sort of slipperiness all throughout. Um, there's a citation to a Law Review article written by uh, then Judge Kavanaugh, now Justice Kavanaugh, which again, uh, is, if you read it, is actually about whether or not a sitting president should be criminally investigated, but it is framed That's in his this Minas- brief. That's his University of Minnesota article, right? Correct. Yeah, I was with him when he gave that. So he and I were the two keynote speakers at that conference. And uh, uh, yeah, and I, I was I was there for the the giving of that speech actually. Right. So Ben then might have been surprised uh, to to see how it would be used in in this brief. Um, there's there's all kind of strangenesses. The one of the the segments that really got me was actually a citation to uh, Federalist sixty five. Where, uh, so Trump is essentially saying, oh, you know, if we look to this Federalist paper, we can see that Alexander Hamilton is arguing that, you know, any offenses that the president commits in the course of his official acts, and I quote, are of a nature which may with pe- peculiar propriety be denominated political, end quote, and therefore can't be tried in an Article Three court. And if you read that in the brief, you might think, oh my gosh, like, this is so clear. Why hasn't anyone raised this before now? Of course, Trump can't be tried for for things that he did in office. If you go and look at Federalist 65, Hamilton is, that is a uh, Federalist paper about why the Senate should be the trial court for impeachments. So the conduct that he's talking about here is explicitly not criminal conduct. It is impeachable conduct. Um, it's just completely misrepresented. 
Uh, so there's there's all kinds of stuff like that throughout this brief. I suspect if I were on the Supreme Court, I would probably be most irked by Trump taking my own words and substantially misrepresenting them in a brief filed before me. Uh, but but who knows? <laughs> um, it's it certainly doesn't strike me as great lawyering. I think it's fair to say. I mean, I don't know. What what do either of you think? Is this going to backfire? It it did not backfire at the DC circuit where he did substantially the same thing involving subst- a bunch of the same quotations. You know, he did not get called out for it at oral argument and I don't think he he didn't snooker anybody. I, I don't think it was like, you know, Judges Childs and Henderson were like, oh, well, he said Sam Alito said X. I don't think I'll bother to look up, you know, the sentences before and after. Uh, so, and we should say he, he's used this mischievous site to Alito before. Yes, in exactly. And, and at the D.C. Circuit level and at the district court level, as I recall. And so, like, I, I, I don't think – it's not misconduct, right? It's not like, you know, th- they're ethically obliged to make every argument that they can that might possibly help the client that isn't, you know, that isn't completely farcical or, uh, and so, you know, you often get some ridiculous arguments made. Uh, and by the way, one of their core arguments, which is that there's a double jeopardy problem with have with trying somebody who's already been acquitted by the Senate and that you know conviction in the Senate is a an impeachment is a prerequisite to abrogating presidential immunity that doesn't exist like that is itself a completely ridiculous argument um and no no judge on any court below has entertained it seriously look they've got a very weak hand and their job here is to make that weak hand eat up as many months as possible. Um, it's not to win. It's not to persuade anybody of anything. It's to eat up time. And so I don't think you should evaluate these arguments really sort of like as though they're on the level legal arguments. This strategy is working. All right. Anything else we want to touch on in in D.C. before we go to Mar-a-Lago? Excellent. Let's do it. Um, So, Roger, uh, you, of course, were uh, freshly out of the courtroom (laughs) during last week's Trump trials during a a quite eventful hearing on some motions to dismiss before Judge Cannon. She was unusually productive uh, (laughs) in the the hours after you, you left the courtroom. Can you just refresh everybody on what's been happening down there? Sure. She held a hearing both morning and afternoon on two of the roughly nine uh, motions to dismiss and suppress that have been filed. And uh, one was a motion to dismiss uh, based on uh, the idea that the first 32 counts, the willful retention of national defense information, Uh, are uh, unconstitutionally vague as to him, as to a former president. And the second was uh, the idea that the uh, whole indictment has to be dismissed on a theory relating to the Presidential Records Act. And uh, uh, both of the, there was some overlap between these motions. And in fact, there was some overlap between them and a third motion which has actually still not been publicly docketed, but is a selective and vindictive prosecution motion that he's filed. She did quickly uh, rule after, within less than three hours after the hearing, she denied without prejudice the first of those motions. Uh, Without prejudice is a little strange because we're not going to have another motion to dismiss and nothing's going to change. There isn't a motion for summary judgment in the criminal context, but she was hinting that some of these same issues could come up with respect to jury instructions. And it sounded like the second one was also going to be disposed of in the same way, um, because uh, 
it sort of hinged on a, a factual dispute, the notion that the president, uh, that Trump had, uh, the former president had the, the, his lawyers always call him President Trump. The, the former president had um, designated these documents as personal and that this somehow effectively repeals the Espionage Act with respect to his possession of them. So anyway, uh, rather than ruling on that on Monday, she sort of shocked all of us with uh, an order that uh, proposed, that asked the uh, attorneys to get back with her to her with instructions, jury instructions relating to this charge, and particularly with a portion of it relating to unauthorized possession and discussing how the PRA, the Presidential Records Act, interacts with the Espionage Act, and proposing two uh particular instructions that were that were very odd and i i think to set this up i i i have to tell you a little bit uh, just a little bit more i step back so the statute is that he's being charged with for the first 32 counts goes like this this is the willful retention charge it's whoever having unauthorized possession of dot 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 any document dot, 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 relating to the national defense, dot, 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 and willfully retains the same, dot, 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 shall be guilty of a crime. So the key thing is here, unauthorized possession. I mean, uh, you also have to willfully retain it, but let's focus on un unauthorized possession. What Trump's team is now suggesting and is, is is something for which there is no factual basis yet whatsoever. It's the theory that when he left the White House, he was designating these highly sensitive documents created by the intelligence community as his personal documents under the Presidential Records Act. Now, there's no speck of evidence that Trump knew what the Presidential Records Act was when he left the president, when he left the White House, let, let alone that he was designating them. Also, I, I, let me just read you the definition of personal from the Presidential Records Act. They are documents of a purely private or non-public character which do not relate to or have an effect upon the carrying out of the constitutional, statutory, or other official duties of the president. Now, could that be classified documents about our nuclear capabilities, about plans of military attack, plans of how to respond to military attack? And the, the statute gives examples of personal documents, diaries, journals, or other personal notes serving as the functional equivalent of a diary or a journal, which are not prepared or utilized for transacting governmental business. So the theory here is that when he took these out of the White House, we must deem that he must have been thinking that these are presidential. He didn't take them to NARA. That would be what you do with presidential records. So what could he have been doing except designating them as personal, even though they obviously aren't personal? And and then there's another leap. The, the other leap is that somehow the Presidential Records Act gives him authority to possess classified documents. There's no evidence in the Presidential Records Act, which is, in, in, you know, enacted in late 70s, that it intended to repeal the Espionage Act, which forbids possessing these sorts of documents without various forms of uh, uh, authorization, and, and also requires that you not keep them in your ballroom or, you know, in your bathroom. But 
she is entertaining the idea that uh, silently the PRA did that. And so in these jury instructions, these proposed jury instructions, she talks about how she might instruct the jury about the interaction between the PRA. Well, she doesn't talk about the espionage, but but these are with ref, re, with reference to authorization, the defining of authorization under the Espionage Act. So A is in a prosecution of a former president for allegedly retaining documents in violation of the statute Espionage Act. A jury is permitted to examine a record retained by the former president in his or her personal possession at the end of his presidency and make a factual finding as to whether the government has proved beyond a reasonable doubt that it is personal or presidential using the definition set forth in the Presidential Records Act. So that's the first one, which is odd because it asks the jury to make really what is a legal finding. The second one is stranger because it asks the jury to make a false legal finding. It, it, it says a president has sole authority under the PRA to categorize records as personal and presidential during his or her presidency. Neither a court nor a jury is permitted to make or review such a categorization decision. Although there is no, for, no formal means in the PRA by which a president is to make that categorization, an outgoing president's decision to exclude what he or she considers to be personal records from presidential records transmitted to the National Archives constitutes a president's categorization of those records as personal under the PRA. So he, she is instructing them that Trump did designate these as personal, and presumably that would mean he's authorized to use them. Why are you defining it otherwise? So this is an extraordinary definition. Now, I've been hiding the ball a little bit to, to some will say, because I, I haven't told you about the judicial watch ruling. So this was a, a case in 2012 involving the so-called Clinton Sox case. Clinton, during his administration, asked Taylor Branch, a historian, to make tapes of him that would be that he would use as a sort of memoir. And so sometimes he would be giving his thoughts, you know, he'd be t talking about his thoughts about, you know, reactions to the presidency. But there were times where, you know, it would capture him in the act of being president. He would take a phone call and you would hear his side of the conversation. So he took these tapes or, or I don't know, Branch did. I don't, it's not really clear. After his administration, he obviously did not send them to NARA. And it sounds, you know, generally like the functional equivalent of a diary, although there was probably captured some sensitive information. We don't know for sure, but likely. So afterwards, this right-wing uh, third party, public interest group, uh, Judicial Watch, wants to obtain these, and I th guess through FOIA, and NAR they send a request to the archives, NARA, and they say, we don't have them, we've never had them, we think uh, they're personal. Uh, so we think they were correctly categorized. So then uh, Judicial Watch sues NARA and asks the judge, we want you to uh, declare that these were presidential records, not personal, and then somehow force NARA to claw these back from Clinton, which would probably require NARA going to the attorney general and asking the attorney general to do something about clawing these back from Clinton. And so Judge Amy Berman Jackson says a number of things. You know, she says, I'm not sure I have the power. First of all, I think they're probably, you know, it, it sounds like they're 
personal records. But even if I thought they weren't, I don't know if I have the power. I sort of doubt I have the power to overturn the president's decision about that. And I doubt I have the power to order NARA to change its decision. And I certainly don't have the power to force NARA to ask the AG's office, the, the attorney general, to claw it back from Clinton. So there's no redressability here. I'm dismissing. Now, uh, you might, there's still, from everything I've told you, there's still no finding in there that the very act of taking something out of the White House turns it into a personal record. Um, where that comes from is from a March 2012 hearing where they're discussing these things, and some government lawyer says offhandedly, well, presumably, when he took the records out of the White House, he must have been deciding that they were personal. And that's the basis for this legal instruction to the jury. You must conclusively find that that's what he was doing. By the way, that's how all those Brookings printers ended up at my house. The act of my removing them... <laughs> constituted my designation of them as personal property. And and that's why there's all this really nice, you know, microphones and studio equipment that says the Brookings Institution, but it's at my house and I consider it my personal property. Well, exactly. By this reasoning, he could have stolen the Resolute Desk out of the Oval Office when he went to Mar-a-Lago. Although I think the Resolute Desk isn't a record. Well, he has unfettered categorization power, mm. and it's unreviewable. It's unreviewable and it's unfettered. I just, you know, these classified records are not personal right. either. Right. And, you know, yeah, it's not a record either, but it's unreviewable, unfettered power. So uh, that's judicial watch. As, as uh, his his people will say, and then the other half of it is what happens about all penal laws, all, like theft. And the answer is, oh, the PRA silently repealed those as to the president, just like it repealed the Espionage Act. So it's unbelievable. Now she hasn't ordered it. You know, it's engaged with this, but it is it is out there. And so let's let's talk about the way that she put together these potential jury instructions. Uh, there's there were reports in both the Washington Post and the New York Times after this came out, essentially quoting a bunch of lawyers and law professors saying, "I have never seen an order that looks anything like this." Have either of you ever seen an order that looks anything like this? And why is it unusual? Yeah, so I I want to answer that question in the context of the previous question because the the oddity of the the format of the document itself is an expression of the oddity of the content of the document. Let me start with a couple things that I want to add to Roger's excellent substantive points. The first is like there are some genuine questions here that are actually hard and they're the following right so there has been an issue since at least Ronald Reagan about what to do about personal diaries um and so presidents keep diaries or sometimes as in Bi Biden's case vice presidents keep diaries and you know if you're the president and you're keeping a diary there's going to be some classified information in there because you're, you're actually writing down what happens to you and some of it is inherently classified. And so when Reagan left office, he took a whole bunch of diaries to Simi Valley, California, and the government was aware that these were uh, personal diaries with classified material and everybody acknowledged that these were personal diaries and the government didn't have an issue with it. And eventually, Reagan wanted to, I guess after Reagan's death, they wanted to publish the diaries. So the government at that point redacted the classified information and 
retrieved that part that was that was classified and they published the rest was basically what happened. It was a runaway bestseller, by the way, and it changed a lot of people's views, including mine of Ronald Reagan, who we all had thought was stupid before. And then we read his diaries and he was actually a quite thoughtful guy. It was pretty interesting. Um, this same issue arises in the her investigation of Biden, right? Biden keeps diaries, they're personal property, but they have classified information in them, and he brings them home to Delaware just the way Reagan did. This is a very hard question. If you have your undisputed personal property that has government information in it and that you're entitled to write and then you cease to be president, who owns that? What, what are the rules governing that? This is a very hard question. That is not what's happening here. And Judge Cannon is trying to make it seem like that's the situation that is arising here. The 31 or 32 documents at issue in this are government produced documents, not presidential. They're not like Ron, uh, Ronald Reagan went out and bought some diaries and wrote in them, right? So they're government information in a personal document. These are like the Defense Department has a report that it gives to the president. And it says in big letters, top secret SCI, no foreign, which means no foreign uh, distribution, uh, sensitive compartmentalized uh, information on it. Uh, we've all seen Class, uh, declassified versions of these documents. This is a government produced product that is made for the president in his official capacity as president. It is a question of law, not of fact, whether this is something that he's entitled to designate personal and then leave with. And the answer is no. He's not entitled to just leave with that. And there's, can, can I make one additional yeah. note? So I believe there's, there's at least one document here that was classified under the Atomic Energy Act. Um, so it's, it's even something that was classified by another branch of government. Well, not another branch, but it's classified under a statutory regime that is separate and, uh, not classified under the executive order. Yeah. But but the but the point is to say that this is personal based on designation is a little bit like saying this is a duck based on personal like you can designate it as a duck if you want, but there's such a thing as a duck. And it either is a duck or it isn't a duck. And the Presidential Records Act does not let you just say, Oh, Quinta, that paper on your desk, it's actually a duck. So that's the first thing. That brings us to the oddity of this document. Now, there's a few oddities of this document. The first is she has this way, and this is the, not the first time she did, has done this. She did this with the Classified Information Procedures Act briefing, where she sort of throws up her hand and says, I don't really know how to think about this. Both sides, I, I'm ordering you to write me a dissertation explaining this. And please include the following things that I'm confused about, A, B, and C. And it's like, like a little bit like it's like a law school seminar in which she just wants them to do the work for her. Uh, it's not usually the way briefing happens. It sometimes is, but it's a little bit odd, and it's a little bit odd to do it repeatedly. But then the second thing, and what makes this really unlike any court order I've ever seen – is that she turns around and says, when you brief this, when you give me this seminar, let's assume two scenarios. In scenario number one, we're going to issue a jury instruction based on the premise that these papers are a duck. And it's actually just like wrong. Like, why don't you issue a, write a jury instruction on the basis that the world is flat? It's a false premise. And the false premise is that this is a jury question rather than a, a legal question. Uh, that's scenario number one. Scenario number two is even worse because, as, as Roger says, we're going to assume a false position of law, right? So now we're going to assume the earth is flat, write a, a jury instruction based on the idea 
that I have already determined that the earth is flat as a matter of law. And so it does feel like, would you rather, you know, the old stupid drinking game, would you rather this or that, right? Would you rather be flayed with an iron comb or, you know, have your, you know, your, you know, be drawn and quartered and have your uh, parts uh, distributed to the four quarters of the kingdom. And it really does have that flavor all with this kind of very turgid prose that's very hun- hard to unpack. Uh, so I, I think it's the single weirdest judicial opinion I've ever read. It's, it's two and a half pages or something. And it, I, I read it like five times and couldn't, I still don't entirely understand it. Um, and I imagine there are people in the special counsel's office who are really tearing their hair out on how to respond to it right now. Yeah, I mean, so how, how are they supposed to respond to it? Like, Roger, what are you expecting? Well, they have until April 2nd. Another odd thing, of course, is that they did already brief most of these issues in the course of the last, you know, the motion to dismiss. But I I think, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure what the government will say uh, is, uh, look, there there is an instruction you could give but it's contingent upon facts that we don't know yet whether they will be able to introduce at trial. You know, they need to get any instruction on on this. They need to show us that he knew what the PRA was. It, it, It doesn't go to authority. It goes to willfulness. Authority comes from the executive order. He didn't have it. Willfulness means, did he realize that he was doing something wrong? And you could imagine somebody so confused, you know, somebody who had been talking to Tom Fitton for a long time and thought, you know what? I, I can take these documents. I can, you know, it's total. I read Judicial Watch. I have unfettered discretion. It's unreviewable. I'm going to declare these personal and I'm going to imagine that this immunizes me from uh, the Espionage Act. And then that would go to, you know, if the jury believed he went through that process in good faith and made a mistake, that would not be willfulness. And so it does go, you know, that's how you get a jury instruction on this subject. But the condition precedent to that is that Something has to happen at trial. And that's why usually the jury instructions are decided at a much later stage, including during trial they're finalized. Uh, And then, you know, they're delivered the last thing, either before or after the summations. So an instruction like this. So um, that's, that's the other, that's the other weird thing. So I do want to make sure that we get to the the Georgia and New York cases, but I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to de- depart this too soon. If there's other stuff you'll want to touch on, yeah, Roger. Just just one uh, plug. Um, if you're interested in this, I wrote a very deep dive of what happened at the hearing Thursday, and at the end of that deep dive, I provide um, links to the orders that she issued afterwards. And and uh, so you can read them for yourselves. I think it's called something like Judge Cannon's two hearings on Thursday or something like that in law firm. Yes, it is uh, Judge Cannon's Thursday hearing on two motions to dismiss um, and highly, highly recommended. Um, before we move on, I... Uh, there is also some some breaking news this morning about uh, what seems to be Judge Cannon's perhaps difficulty holding on to law clerks. Um, so according to David Lott, who is a longtime legal writer and now has a substack, um, two of Judge Cannon's clerks quit in the last year. That's pretty unusual. I think it is fair to say getting a clerkship in a federal court is a pretty coveted position for anyone coming out of law school. And you really don't tend to see people leave, even if they're in a bad situation. Um, so, Ben, tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, so I've got to be a little bit careful about the way I talk about this, because I actually know who one of these law clerks is, and I don't 
want to out somebody who has not spoken and doesn't want to be uh, uh, in the public uh, eye. But yeah, a few days ago, I was approached with a uh, tip about a law clerk who had left Judge Cannon's employment early. I would say a uh, an evaluation of this person's social media tended to confirm the the parameters of what David Latt would later reported, um, which was that the clerk in question had left early and the social media did suggest that there was some difficulty in the clerkship. I don't really know more than that. Um, and I, um, I do think, I, I, I do think this is a, a very high pressure situation for like even a judge who was, you know, new and trying to handle this in good faith. And I honestly doubt that Judge Cannon is ha- trying to handle this in good faith. But I do think that being, uh, it, it's a very stressful situation to have the biggest case of your lifetime drop on your desk when you've been on the bench for a year or whatever she has. She's, you know, quite inexperienced, um, honestly, from her work product and from watching her. I, I don't think she's the brightest bulb on the federal district bench. And, um, and so it's not all that surprising to me that, uh, David reports that two clerks have bolted early, uh, which is a very unusual thing. One of them may have been because of a, uh, he reports because the clerk had a baby and so left uh, a year early. Uh, one of them does not appear to be that. And I guess I just would say uh, he doesn't name any of them. He doesn't appear to have talked to either of them. Um, and so I think it's worth being circumspect about what this says about Judge Cannon. I will say that having clerks leave early particularly clerks who are, you know, you go to law school thinking maybe I'll get a big one, a big case in my during my clerkship, and leaving in the middle of a trial of a former president, like something has to have happened for that to have happened. Um, and so I, I don't know, I guess I will leave it at that. All right, well, let's, let's go to Georgia. Um, so we're still living in the aftermath of uh, Judge Scott McPhee's ruling, uh, finding that though Fannie Willis was not disqualified from prosecuting the case in Fulton County against Trump, she had the choice of firing Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade or stepping away. Nathan Wade then uh, immediately <laughs> stepped down, uh, was intending to give a TV interview and then bailed out of that. So alas, we we have gone without his insight. Um, but there have been a few developments. Um, Trump and a number of his co-defendants uh, filed a request for appeal. Uh, McAfee has granted that certificate. Um, so where where do things stand now? What happens next? I know you've both been following this case, so whoever wants to jump in first. Yeah, so I mean, it honestly depends who you ask, right? If you talk to the defense, uh, the next step is that they're going to the Georgia Court of Appeals and Scott McAfee has, you know, given the thumbs up to an immediate appeal, and this case is still all about Fonnie Willis, uh, her conflicts of interest, and her uh, sex life. And if you ask Fonnie Willis, uh, she is heading to trial. I believe it was reported today that she plans to go forward with asking a trial date for this summer as early as possible. And if you ask Judge McAfee, the answer seems to be both, because he uh, did in fact approve the certificate of immediate appealability, but he also means to keep uh, holding pretrial uh, conferences and hearing motions and moving toward trial, which either means that he thinks that the Georgia Court of Appeals is going to uh, reject the case uh, and not hear it, which is, of course, it's a matter of discretionary review, or he thinks that he will retain jurisdiction 
uh, while they're considering this one conflict question. By the way, it's a sort of murky matter under Georgia law, uh, whether that's true or not. So I think a lot depends, honestly, on whether the Georgia Court of Appeals wants to hear this case or just wants it to come up uh, in due course post-conviction, assuming that there are convictions. Roger, anything you want to add on that score? I probably shouldn't because I don't know the pertinent Georgia law. I'll just say that just from reading his order, what I thought he was saying, uh, and uh, I might be wrong and he might be wrong, (laughs) is that, you know, he was going to go ahead and rule on some fully briefed motions that no one could really dispute that. And what I think is not clear is whether Fonnie Willis can go into court in any, you know, until this is resolved. That That's what I thought he was saying, but it, 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 uh, I'll wait till the real Georgia experts uh, weigh in. Yes, we're, we're flying blind without Anna Bauer this yeah, week. Yeah, exactly. Who's who's still with us, by the way. She just couldn't be here today. Yes, to, to be clear. <laughs> She she's not like a clerk who just uh, flew Absconded. the coop. Absconded. No, Anna. For those who are inquiring after her health and well being, there is a room. There is one room of her palatial mansion that does not cannot connect to uh, this uh, live stream, and that is her jet. And she is currently in transit, um, and does not the Wi Fi on the jet just isn't good enough to support uh, live streaming. Yes, maybe maybe one day soon. All right, so let's then uh, move northward to New York, where we've had a few minor updates. Um, we've had some orders from Justice Merchan on uh, some motions in limine concerning uh, the admissibility of evidence and witness testimony from Trump. Um, and we've also had a bit of an update on the mysterious document dump from the Southern District of New York. Um, again, I know you've both been keeping an eye on this. Let's maybe start with uh, uh, Justice Merchand ru- ruling on the motions in limine and then move to uh, the SDNY document issue. So what what exactly did the justice order? So he, he had a series of uh, rulings, and I think he was they're, – they're sort of significant. Uh, they winnow out some stuff that might have been the most – prejudicial or emotionally prejudicial or the, 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 you know, the headlines are uh, Michael Cohen certainly can testify. There were some, uh, you know, Hail Marys that uh, were, were in the motions uh, uh, from, from Trump. But um, the August 2015 Trump tower meeting will be admissible. That's sort of crucial. That's, you know, one month after he declares his candidacy, allegedly he meets with, Cohen, Michael Cohen, and uh, the uh, David Pecker, and they uh, of uh, the parent company of National Enquirer, and they uh, allegedly make this pact that they're going to try to prevent negative stories about Trump from getting published. They're going to try to buy those off, and and then they are going to try to publish uh, negative stories about his opponent. And then uh, there are three people that were paid, allegedly paid off. Uh, the important one, though, all of the counts relate to Stormy Daniels or Stephanie Clifford. So there was some question about whether, you know, they wanted to limit the testimony or ban the testimony uh, relating to the other two, a guy named Dino Sajudin, something like that, and Karen McDougal. And the ruling is that uh, the fact of what happened with them the the alleged payoffs that that can come in but exactly what allegedly transpired between those individuals and the defendant cannot so th- you know that's uh, uh pretty significant th- um and i think you know mcdougal might be a better a more sympathetic witness in many ways than stormy daniels so i think it's important to the people to be able to call her. And this does sort of limit how much they can get out of her. A big, big thing also is the Access Hollywood tape. They can talk about it, but they can't show it. 
that's a big one. Um, the way it's described in the uh, ruling is uh, people can elicit testimony about a videotaped interview which surfaced on October 7th. 2016 that contained comments of a sexual nature which defendant feared could hurt his presidential aspirations. Which is such a a polite way to put it. It is. That's a very anodyne. So uh, that's a, I think that's something of a victory for Trump. He wanted to call an expert to talk about federal campaign, federal election campaign uh, finance. Uh, Most of that was stricken, uh, not all of it. Uh, he also wanted to use a uh, advice of counsel light sort of defense. He wanted to, he was, it was sort of called presence of counsel. The idea was that he would get across the idea, well, counsel was present in the room, so I sort of thought this must be okay. And the the reason to do it that way is that if you do a real advice of counsel defense, you have to waive attorney-client privilege and a whole lot of stuff comes uh, goes over to the other side that you probably don't want. He reserved, uh, he also is a, a reserving decision on some uh, important questions, which he'll decide in context. Uh, the people will have to uh, provide an offer of proof. Um, and uh, the, for instance, they wanted to produce, to uh, introduce alleg- two allegations of sexual assault that uh, surfaced after the Access Hollywood tape. He's going to reserve decision on that. The the pressure campaign on Cohen not to cooperate, um, social media attacks on Cohen and Daniels, the fact that a few days after the arraignment in this case, he sued Michael Cohen for $500 million. Uh, that one it, it is not clear. And um, that, that suit, by the way, has been withdrawn. And uh, two references from books that Trump wrote. One is a line from the 2004 classic, How to Get Rich. The line is, when somebody hurts you, just go after them as viciously and violently as you can. And uh, the other is from the t- 2007 sequel uh, called Think Big, Make It Happen in Business and in Life. Uh, when you are wronged, go after those people because it is a good feeling and because other people will see you doing it. So I guess he's reserved decision on uh was that Khalil Gibran or was that or was that Donald Trump I, okay i guess that was trump okay so those were i thought the the key uh the key key rulings so let's then talk about what's been happening with these documents from the US attorney's office from the southern district of new york so if listeners recall uh the trial was originally meant to start on march 25th that is monday Justice Mershon ended up pushing that back by 20 days uh, after he was alerted that essentially the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York had provided uh, the parties with an enormous tranche of documents such that it would be difficult to get the trial moving on time. Um, I think it, it was in the order of 10,000 or excuse me, 100,000 pages um, all told together. And I will say that uh, the filing from DA Bragg's office initially alerting the court of this seemed uh, somewhat irked um, about the the fact that they had just had this document production dumped on them by SGNY kind of at the last minute. Um, ben, can you just walk us through what's going on here and what we know from the latest filings? Yeah. So I think we actually pretty much know what happened now, which uh, – And I am willing to go out on a limb and say that this is going to end up being something of a tempest in a teapot. Justice Mershon is the, the trial was supposed to start next week on Monday. That has been converted into a hearing to decide what to do about this. The list of options run from do nothing, reschedule the trial sooner rather than later. Uh, according to the state, to dismiss the whole indictment because of these uh, so-called discovery abuses by Trump um, and or to by the state, according to Trump. The, the, so the state today filed a 
fairly detailed account of precisely what happened. And their uh, account boils down to this. Uh, first of all, they asked for relevant material from the state a long time ago. Number two, from the federal government. Number two, the government took a long time to produce it. Number three, Trump never complained about the pace or adequacy of their production. Number four, a subpoena was not issued for this until sometime in January. And since then, the federal government has, the, the U.S. Attorney's Office has produced it to the state and the state has promptly produced it to Trump's lawyers, to the defense. And therefore, there is really no abuse of discretion, of, of discovery. The state, there's no entitlement to receive this stuff six months before trial rather than, say, a few weeks before trial. Um, and the state is not responsible for the slow pace of the federal government's production to the state. And the state behaved appropriately and turned it over in a timely fashion to the defense once it had access to it. So that is the parameters of the dispute. And I think we will know Monday whether Justice Mershon regards this as a, a blip, which is the way the uh, – oh, and th there's another important thing, which is that the government contends that almost none of these 100,000 pages are actually relevant to anything. So that I think the number is 270 of the uh, you know tens of thousands of pages are actually relevant, and the government notes that they're actually inculpatory and corroborative of the government's story anyway. So the defense is not prejudiced by this having come in late. So presumably, the defense has a very different view of this. Um, that is that this material was um, maliciously and illegally withheld, and that the case – by the way, you can punish discovery abuses by dismissing a case in extreme situations. You don't have to as a judge. I would be very surprised if Justice Mershon did that in this case. And so I think what we're going to see on Monday is likely going to be him satisfying himself that the the discovery is complete, that the, the state of New York, the DA's office, behaved in good faith in the entire time. It's not really before him whether the U.S. Attorney's Office did or should have moved faster. Uh, and then he will presumably reschedule the trial, my guess is not very many weeks from now. So I think this is going to turn out to have been a uh, a little bit of a tempest in a teapot. It certainly screwed up Roger and my uh, personal plans, uh, which were, you know, involved decamping to New York for a number of weeks starting next week. I just want to say to all the courts involved in these cases really need to consult with us before you delay things. Our needs are not adequately being considered. That said, I don't think this one is that big a deal. All right, let's go to questions. Uh, so first question is from Bob, um, who asks, what are the possible implications if Trump is convicted in one of the criminal cases between Election Day and Inauguration Day? And I assume this is assuming that he wins on Election Day. What happens then? Well, so I can give you the following on this. This is super uncharted territory. And uh, a uh, Scott Anderson and I, uh, a few months ago, were asked by a Democracy Concerned Foundation to produce a kind of presentation on a series of scenarios related to this question. And the people we presented it to were so shocked by it that we thought we should record it basically as a lawfare podcast and just recreate the presentation for the general public. So we did that. And, um, but that is a full hour presentation on exactly the scenario of what happens if Trump is convicted and elected in all four jurisdictions that these are. The short answer is, uh, we think the presidency wins, but there are a lot of wrinkles. 
Next question uh, from David Weinstein, who asks, if the Georgia appeals court decides to hear Trump's appeal of McAfee's failure to disqualify Willis, can Willis immediately appoint an assistant Fulton County DA to manage the case and then resign to avoid further delay? I don't think that would be the means that by which it would happen. I think, first of all, she wouldn't do that um, because the Fulton County DA does a lot of other things other than prosecuting former presidents. I think the more likely scenario would be that she would moot the appeal by recusing herself from this issue, um, from this case. If she were to recuse herself, she would recuse the entire office with her. As Anna has explained on a number of occasions, that would mean kicking the thing uh, to a board in Georgia run by the improbably named Mr. Scandalakis. Um, and uh, the Scandalakis board is responsible for remedying scandals and recusals and reassigning cases. It would probably realistically mean the end of the case. All right, we have a, another question from David Weinstein who asks, would Judge Cannon endorse a Rule 29 motion for acquittal before or after the case goes to the jury? And what – and this is – the next question I think is is really gets to something I've been wondering too. What issue can prosecutors take to the 11th Circuit to try to remove Cannon from the case? This is a good question that I should have researched more and I'm trying to research. I don't think she's aiming for a true, you know, Rule 29 at the end of the government's case – where she has to do it. Some of those instructions sounded like she wants to give the jury almost no choice but to do it. That's not appealable. If she does it, it's not appealable. If the jury should convict and then she overturns it, that is appealable. Is Nothing is appealable right now because she hasn't ruled on anything. She's just said, engage with this uh, prose. And, uh, and I sort of doubt that she will make a ruling of, about this before the jury is sworn in. Once the jury is sworn in, could you do a mandamus then? Uh, that I, I need to ask Dan Richman or somebody, you know, uh, uh, but you would have the whole jury waiting uh, while you appeal. Uh, I'm not sure how that works. Because you don't like a jury instruction. I mean, it would be, it would, you would have to be an awfully bad jury instruction to justify sort of like, all right, jury, go home while the Eleventh Circuit, yeah. while we man man mandamus the judge to the Eleventh Circuit. That's a tough one. Yeah, but uh, uh, but it, this would be, you know, this would be worth it uh, if it's that second one. Uh, you'd have no choice; you have to do it. All right. Next question, Roger. You have a, a fan. Um, Catherine says that your blow by blow report on Judge Cannon's hearing was enthralling and made me feel like I was in the courtroom. How do you keep detailed track of all of the action? Uh, well, thank you, Catherine. I appreciate that. I am uh, so old that I was taught uh, to do a sort of shorthand type of thing. Uh, it's called speed writing. It's a it's a simplistic sort of shorthand, and it's really a powerful tool. And uh, I can I can take a fair amount of. Uh, uh, notes as a as an aside. When I was uh, clerking uh, in 1982 uh, uh, in Texas, the U.S. court reporter, um, certified court reporter, took uh, used shorthand, pure shorthand, no machine whatsoever. She was one of the last, um, but uh, it, you know it's possible to do. I can't do it that. It is an awesome skill. Yeah, yeah. No, she was, it was amazing. I heard it here first, folks. Analog is superior. <laughs> Roger, Roger will never be stopped by a ban on electronics in the courtroom. <laughs> I, I, it was hard, though, because I was without my TikTok for almost eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So uh, next question um, from Jeff, who asks, do you dare speculate on whether Trump's strategy of delay will cause his own October surprise from a guilty verdict in one of his trials? So I want to turn that question back to Quinta, <laughs> because yeah. for those of you who do not subscribe to Dog Shirt Daily, we posted, and by we, I mean I, posted a little napkin drawing that Quinta made yesterday following uh, a a conversation that she and I had on the phone. And uh, I, I want to uh, – let's uh, um, you know, hold it up so people can see it and give us a little explanation. So, yeah. So, Ben and I were discussing how uh, Trump's – uh, delay tactics are very beneficial to him right up until the point where they're extremely not beneficial. And then they quickly become beneficial again. And so the argument essentially is, you know, the farther longer he's able to push back the DC trial, the better it is. Um, it's not in the news. It's, you know, he doesn't have the, the risk of a potential conviction. The problem is that there's a, a scenario where he pushes it back just enough that it goes to trial right in the heat of election season. You know, say we have a trial ongoing in September, October, and then potentially a guilty verdict, um, you know, right at the end of October, the beginning of November, right before people are casting their votes. Um, and <laughs> there we go. Um, and, and yeah, so that is what I have identified here as the black hole of awful. So I, I mean, I don't know. I suspect that delaying for him has gone pretty well so far, and there's no reason to to think that uh, he will stop. But it does seem to me that we're entering a period where it's actually pretty risky for him to have delayed, um, because if if you're him and your options are either having the January sixth trial in September or having the January sixth trial in this this past March or this this current March, I think you might prefer March, um, assuming that the op they're uh, just delaying it indefinitely is is not an option. Does that sound right to both of you? It does, but I I want you to articulate your scenario that is the worst conceivable scenario for Trump, which was uh, the one that gave rise to the phrase "black hole of awful." But so that's but that's he if he's found guilty immediately before the vote. Yeah, but specifically on Halloween. I, <laughs> Halloween was just an example, but yes, it, I mean that that would be extra spooky, um, and it would still count as a October surprise. So we'll see. We'll we'll find out. It, it all uh, will depend on on what the Supreme Court does. So we have a question from um, Shannon Idri, who wants to know what we think of the Mar-a-Lago witness speaking out. Um, so this is a, a story that uh, we didn't actually touch on. Um, but I believe his name is is Brian Butler. Um, he is Trump employee five in the indictment. And he's been giving some interviews and talking a little bit about what his experience was like at, at Mar-a-Lago. Um, and sort of talking about his interactions with uh, Mr. D'Olivera, um and I believe Walt Nada as well, who are the other two defendants on this case. So I don't didn't mean to sandbag you if, if uh, you haven't had time to read the stories, but I think at a high level, I'm, I'm curious what you think of, of uh, someone who is a potential witness going out there and talking to the press in a manner unflattering to Trump, it's worth saying. Um, so Trump might not be happy about this, but if I were Jack Smith, I might not be happy either. Roger, do you have thoughts on this one? Actually, this was one that fell through the cracks. I, I was surprised. I'm sure Jack Smith just hated to see this. Uh, but, you know, uh, people do have these First Amendment rights that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so... That's actually, like, I'm sure Jack Smith does not like it, but, you know, it's no different from Mike Pence. It's no different from Cassidy Hutchinson. It's no different from lots of other people who have to balance uh, their responsibilities to the court, uh, their responsibilities to the justice system, uh, with their other needs to put their life back together. And by the way, that includes expressive needs. Uh, and so, uh, from a Jack Smith point of view, you don't like to see it because, uh, the more statements that somebody has, the easier it is for them to contradict themselves and those become a basis for cross-examination. It's always better if the witness is 
pure and pristine and has given, you know, one set of statements to the grand jury and nothing else, right? Maybe there's an FBI 302 or something, but there's basically nothing besides what you put on the witness stand. But, you know, the First Amendment is not a, a loophole. It's, it's a, it's a real thing. And, you know, witnesses have rights and, uh, it's not just defendants who have rights. And, uh, this person, uh, is entitled to speak to, to the press. All right. Next question, uh, from Tom J, who has two questions. So let's take them in order. First, is there anything that prevents a justice from withholding a vote? So this is about the immunity issue. Um, and delaying an opinion on the presidential immunity case. In other words, could Justice Thomas, for example, withhold his vote indefinitely or at least until the fall, keeping the court from issuing an opinion this term? The theoretical question of whether one could is – so it wouldn't happen quite that way. What would – because the vote, the vote actually takes place at conference a few days after oral argument. You can't really delay the vote. What you can delay is the opinion. And as a general matter, as a courtesy to the justices, the opinions don't issue until all the justices are finished writing. Uh, there is one really important caveat to that, which is that the opinions all issue, unless a case is held over, by June 30th, or sometimes it'll run into July 1. But by the end of the Supreme Court term, the Supreme Court disposes of all its business. So you can imagine a slow walking justice just not finishing his dissent in a timely fashion such that, you know, the opinion doesn't issue quickly. But it's very hard to imagine that going past the end of term, which is to say June, June 30th. The question that I don't know the answer to is what happens if one justice has not finished his or her work by the time the term ends? Do you hold over the case to allow? I think that just never happens. Um, I think they rush, they actually get their work done. But if somebody were, say, a slacker intentionally to slow things down and uh, caused a case to not be done by the time the term ends, what would the court do? I don't know is the answer. Fair enough. Um, all right. Next question from Tom J. Has Judge Cannon's order on March 18th opened the door to an interlocutory appeal under SIPA as it purports to authorize the disclosure of classified national defense documents to the jury, even though there isn't a jury yet? I hear a lot about seeking mandamus, but SIPA has the built-in right to an interlocutory appeal. The March 18 order that I'm aware of is this jury verdict invitation, which doesn't uh, do anything. It just uh, asks for briefing. The jury is going to see these documents. So that is not, uh, you know, that's a weird thing. Uh, the way th th these usually works in SEPA is, uh, and it, it, I, it's strange because the jury obviously won't have clearances. But yeah, they'll see it. And what will probably happen is, however, that the public, there will be some sort of coded discussion so that the public won't know exactly what's in these documents, but the jury will. So uh, that's not something that is going to provoke a SEPA uh, appeal, interlocutory appeal. But the premise of the question is correct. The easiest route to the 11th Circuit is not through a mandamus. It's by Judge Cannon doing something outrageous on SIPA. But so far, it, it seems like she's been, well, of course, we, we don't know because it's a secret. But uh, she, I do, it, you do see a lot of ruling for the government on the SIPA stuff. Yeah. All right. One more question on Judge Cannon. Uh, this is from Gray Brooks, who asks, Roger highlighted something in this week's New York Times piece on Cannon's slow pace, how her made-up free docket approval process has resulted in motions from a month ago still not being publicly docketed. I know you've discussed at length the scarce controls in her behavior, but how does that apply to documents not making it to the docket? For example, what would happen if she brought all the party's communications into email and never allowed them into the docket? What would happen if she said what that was, that is what she was doing, or if she didn't say that, but that was the actual result of her processes? Well... You know, the press 
coalition could bring a, some sort of challenge. What's happening there is a, is a weird because it's really she wanted to be so open that she doesn't want the lawyers to be filing redacted documents at all. So discouraged that she said, I won't let you file redacted documents anymore unless you first ask permission and tell me publicly why it needs to be. And then that turned out to be unworkable. And so everyone started filing things by email. And we've, we've had, uh, you know, like, uh, at least seven, uh, you know, it's hard to tell because it's not docketed, but at least seven motions that were filed or emailed uh, uh, on February 22nd that we still haven't seen. The government has responded to some publicly. For instance, that motion for selective and vindictive prosecution, we've seen the response to it. We haven't seen the original motion. Anyway, uh, as a matter of fact, though, Something a little analogous is going on in New York, too, because uh, Judge Merchon doesn't want, again, he doesn't want, he doesn't want, and the people don't want, the Trump to be quoting willy-nilly from things that are under protective order. But as a result, uh, there is, is a tremendous amount of uh, email traffic, and um, often when we do get documents, they're dated like a week ago, and it's a little confusing. But um, anyway, uh, that's sort of what is going on as far as I can tell. All right. We have a couple more questions, but they're they're both about uh, Trump's financial difficulties and the civil judgments against him. So first question uh, from Simon Van Norden, who's, who asks, regarding Trump's reported difficulties in posting bond for his fines for fraud in New York State Court. Is this a credible problem? There has been reporting that the fines greatly exceed previous reports of his liquidity and that most of his remaining assets are illiquid, e.g. real estate. But how have re heavily leveraged is his real estate portfolio? Mortgages would need to be registered on the title and so should be discoverable. Has there been any reporting su to suggest that he's unable to further mortgage his assets to cover the fines and interest? Should we take claims of his financial distress at face value? I haven't seen uh, in-depth reporting on that. There was something today that uh, apparently uh, the attorney general has been filing the judgments in Westchester on, in anticipation of trying to uh, enforce judgment there if no stay is granted. There was, you know, the first attempt to get the stay was denied, but I think there's still an attempt going on right now. And he has, I think the, the final judgment was entered February 23rd. So we're approaching, we'll know. <laughs> I think it's the we'll 25th. The the, yeah, this, it's Monday. Okay. Yes, which is the same day as the hearing. Look, I, big day in New York. I mean, I, I do have not followed this especially carefully. And, um, my assumption is that he doesn't want to leverage his buildings and that some of his assets are probably more encumbered than he likes to admit. But I don't know the answer to the question, then why aren't there mortgages attached to them? And so I don't want to speculate about what the answer is here because I – the the honest answer is I don't know, and I don't think anybody can know without a closer look at Trump organization assets than any of us is ever allowed to have. I think that's – I agree with that, although we, we may get a fair amount more information soon, especially because we know that the Trump organization has this uh, Special observer. Special monitor. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, so – we we shall see uh, what happens next. Um, and this last question is about uh, the E. Jean Carroll case. This is from Josh Knight, who asks, what is the status of the appeal in the E. Jean Carroll case for which Donald Trump posted about $5 million? Doesn't the subsequent case for which he posted about $90 million depend on the finding by the jury in that earlier case that Trump sexually assaulted her? Could that sexual assault finding be overturned on appeal? So the answer to the first question, yes, it does depend on the finding on, of the first, of the first case. Um, and I would think that if you 
uh, lost the first judgment on appeal, that would that might very well have major implications for the second judgment. Um, and that first case is, I don't know if the appeal has been filed yet. Um, uh, the appeal bond was certainly filed and the, uh, the, I believe the case was noticed for appeal to the Second Circuit, but to my knowledge, I have not seen the actual appeal itself. Uh, there's usually a several month lag between a notice of appeal and, and the actual appeal. I could be wrong about that, and it may be that there's a Second Circuit appeal, and I just didn't see it. I certainly haven't seen one for for what it's worth. All right, those are all the questions we have. Um, So we're going to wrap here. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and we will see you next week. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare podcasts by becoming a Lawfare material supporter through our website, lawfaremedia.org support. You'll also be able to pose questions to our panel and become part of the conversation by joining our webinar on Riverside, available only to our supporters. The podcast is edited by Jen Patia, and your audio engineer this episode was Anna Hickey of Lawfare. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thanks for listening.